Welcome to your brain on porn. This is a series for those who are hooked on porn. Only you can decide if you are. So, my wife and I have a website on relationships. It has nothing to do with porn, or at least it didn't. However, several articles were there on neuroscience of sex, orgasm and love, and evolution in sexuality and even addiction. So about five years ago, porn users began showing up. I guess they found us through Google and they began telling their stories and blogging and sharing and more showed up and more showed up. We learned a lot. Here's a little bit of what we learned. Number one, internet porn is not Playboy, but I bet you already knew this. You know the centerfold of the magazine gets old pretty quick. Internet porn is really far more stimulating than just images. It's really due to the endless novelty and the ability to click from one image to another. Another reason internet porn is so stimulating is that it can escalate rather quickly to more kinky or more shocking material. Number two, addictive personality is not a prerequisite for getting hooked on internet porn. Now, the standard model is that you have to have a predisposition. You have to be genetically inclined to get addicted. Well, this is definitely true. But what we found out is that many of the guys who were showing up on the site had never had any other addiction. They were just regular guys who started watching and got hooked. And what's interesting is once they got off a porn session, they returned to their quote, normal selves. Number three, understanding how heavy porn use affects the brain is very helpful to users. When you understand how the brain works, it really allows you to steer your ship a lot better when you're trying to get off porn. Here are the basics. Porn overstimulated your brain, and your brain changed. You see, being hooked on porn is due to the same brain changes that occur with all addictions. These brain changes are behind your cravings. These brain changes keep you coming back to porn, even if you want to quit. The internet porn is what we call a super stimulus. What that means is that it's way beyond what we've ever encountered during our evolution. Here's the big picture. We're a hunter-gatherer brain, living in a modern world. Our environment has drastically changed. I suppose I don't need to tell you that, yet our brains have barely evolved in the last 100,000 years. This means we are not well suited to many aspects of modern life. From living in isolated boxes, to going to work, to working in desk jobs, to worrying about global warming or the economy. We're supposed to be sitting around the campfire, not sitting in front of a computer watching internet porn for hours a day. Here's another example of environment changing and our brains not quite catching up. I haven't seen too many pictures of fat hunter-gatherers, have you? And yet, 70% of Americans are overweight. So what's going on? Our brains are programmed to love high-calorie foods. That's necessary for survival. In the old days, it was very rare to find high-calorie foods, maybe honey, sweet fruits, nuts. Today, we have refined carbohydrates and high-fat junk foods. All of these are highly stimulating, so they cause supernormal stimulation way beyond anything we've ever encountered. Just like internet porn. Brain rule number one says, you must survive, which means get calories. For food, that means get it while the getting is good because you don't know when something's going to rot, at least in the old days. So your primitive brain is urging you to binge at every opportunity, to get as much as you can. This leads to overconsumption. This rule also applies to sexual partners. Brain rule number two, making babies. Well, maybe that's rule number one. See, evolution's top priority is making more gene packets, more copies of you. Here's a question. In the lifetime of a hunter-gatherer, how many potential sexual partners would he or she meet? Not too many, I imagine. How about how many would he have sex with? I'm sure a whole lot less. A heavy porn user would view more hot babes or hot guys or a hot whatever in one session than our ancestors would need in several lifetimes. So this can be considered another super stimulus. 
Our brains never evolved to handle heavy porn use like this. And unlike junk food, you can never get full. Here's another reason internet porn is so stimulating and so addictive. It takes advantage of an old program located in your primitive brain. The subconscious program is what got you started down the path of using porn. Consider this experiment. It's been done many times. I guess scientists have nothing better to do. What happens when you drop a male rat into a cage with a receptive female? Well, first, you see a frenzy of copulation. Progressively, the male tires of female number one. She wants more, but he's had enough. He just can't get excited anymore. So, what do you do? Well, replace the original female with a fresh one. And the male revives and gallantly struggles to fertilize her. He keeps on going. Then, the same things happen. The male loses interest in female number two. Starting to see a pattern here. This process can be repeated again and again, but with novel partners. Now, I'm not sure how many times this can be repeated, but this can be repeated until the male nearly dies of exhaustion. See, this is a genetic program. This has nothing to do with your genitals. It's all happening in the brain. And the purpose of it is to make more babies. But even more importantly, it's to increase the genetic variety of the male's offspring. Here's an interesting graph, which happens to be about rams. As we can see, we have female presentation at the bottom. We have time to ejaculation in minutes on the left side, and we have a male. In one experiment, the male had the same female over and over again. And in another experiment, he had different females. How long did it take him to ejaculate? Well, if you look at the same female, he got longer and longer until finally, I guess, when they stopped the experiment, it took 18 minutes. Now, a ram only lives 12 years. So 18 minutes is like two hours in our time. So it's quite a bit of time. And of course, with different females, he ejaculated quite quickly, which, of course, means he was very, very excited. If you think about heavy porn users, they often need more novelty, just like these animals, to get excited. Here's what's going on with the animals. It's called the Coolidge effect. It starts out with declining interest in the present sexual partner, then renewed vigor in a novel sexual partner. This is present in all mammals. And it's also present in females, and of course, we said, it's here for genetic variety of the offspring. This is what you started down the road to getting hooked on porn. You see, with porn, you're like a lab rat. Your primitive brain urges you to fertilize the two-dimensional females, or whatever is on your screen. So you're happily married and partnered up. You'd say, no, I'm never going to cheat. Well, either way, the Coolidge effect is still at work in your brain. The more rational parts of your brain are saying, no, I'm not going to cheat. But the primitive parts of your brain are saying, whoa, look at that. Or maybe fantasizing what would be like to have sex, or maybe you're using porn. This is a subtle reminder of the deep programming of your brain, the Coolidge effect, that's there to spread your genes far and wide. Speaking of looking, maybe we're not so unique. Here's an interesting research. The headline is, monkeys pay to see female monkey bottoms. What are they paying with? Well, monkeys love sweets like fruit juice. So in a study, the male monkeys would give up their fruit juice in order to look at female bottoms. You know, this is a little bit like porn, or maybe a lot like porn, monkey porn. Here's the limbic system. The primitive brain where the old program is installed is often called the limbic system, or mammal brain. It's the part of the brain we have in common with all mammals, including that monkey we just saw. It's true we have only a single brain, but certain parts have specific jobs. This part is ancient, 100 million years old or older, and its job is all about survival. Now, I could spend an hour talking about all its functions, but what's important to us is that it governs emotions, such as fear, joy, anger, etc. And importantly, it is also the seat of most of our desires and our drives, including hunger, mate selection, and our sexual urges. You see, sexual desire or libido is not in your genitals. It's here. This is where you experience the Coolidge effect 
and where all addictions happen, including porn addiction. In this graphic, you can see a limbic system in dark color and the cerebral cortex on the outside, which is very large in humans and much smaller in monkeys and rats and other animals. You can think of cerebral cortex as the rational, logical brain, sort of like Spock on Star Trek. It's not emotional, it's the planning, thinking part of our brain, which comes up with clever ideas. Now, the cerebral cortex understands the consequences of our actions. The limbic system does not. Like car engines all have the same basic design, so do all limbic systems, whether it belongs to a rat, cat, dog, or us. Now, whether it's hunger, mothering, mating, or sexual desire, or even addiction, the same brain chemicals and structures do the same jobs in all mammals. You see, scientists aren't studying rat brains to try and figure out how to help rats. No, they're studying them to help us with our addictions and other reasons. The study is useful to us because limbic systems are so similar in all mammals. It's important to remember that the chemical balance of our limbic system shapes how we see the world, shapes our mood. If our limbic brain is out of balance, so is our decision making. At its most basic, the limbic system is all about avoiding pain and repeating pleasure. You see, survival depends on the avoidance of pain, both physical and emotional, and the repetition of pleasure. Hot stove bad, ice cream mm. good, mummy good, snake bad, horn good. You get the idea. Now, you're looking at the center of the brain, sliced down in the middle, and you can see there is this pretty small area called reward circuit. Sometimes you'll also hear the term reward center, and you can see that it actually goes from the limbic system up to the rational brain. This is so important. We're going to be spending most of our time talking about this circuit. You see, this is where you experience all desire and most pleasure, such as sex and orgasm. It's also where you decide what you don't like and what you do like, and that's why it's pretty important. It's small, but in essence, it's running the show. You never make a decision without consulting your reward circuit. If you're addicted to anything, here's where it happened. The reward circuitry is activated whenever we engage in behaviors that further our survival or, more importantly, the survival of our genes. The rule is this. To get motivated, you must be rewarded. So this circuit gives you feelings of pleasure and also the motivation to seek out pleasure. It drives you to eat, engage in sex, take risks and bond. It's where you fall in love with your spouse and with your children and your parents. It also gets activated when your team wins or you feel like an alpha male or you're bungee jumping. The more exciting the experience, the stronger this reward circuitry is activated. But keep in mind that it's also activated for simple pleasures like watching a beautiful sunset, a walk in the woods, or even a smile from a girlfriend. Chemicals turn on and off certain parts of the brain. For the reward circuitry, it's dopamine. It's the main chemical of a group called a neurotransmitters that turns the reward circuitry on. The reward circuitry is the engine. It truly is. And dopamine is the gas. If you really like high-calorie foods, that may be because you actually get a bigger blast of dopamine for it than you do for low-calorie foods. You crave them more because they register as more rewarding. That's why you choose chocolate cake over Brussels sprouts. It has been programmed. Give me high calories. Think about sugar. A sugar buzz is dopamine acting on the reward circuitry. It's not the sugar in your blood acting on the brain. Now, excluding drugs like meth or cocaine, Orgasm is the biggest blast of dopamine. Dopamine has lots of nicknames. The craving neurochemical. The I've got to have it no matter what neurochemical. You see, it's behind all motivation to do anything. You're not craving ice cream or sex with a porn star. No, you're actually craving more stimulation of your reward circuitry. You don't want to win the lotto. You want to activate your reward circuitry. The bigger the surge of dopamine in response to something, the more you want it. Here's a question. Why don't those hedge fund billionaires retire? They certainly don't need any more money. Yes, they want more dopamine in the form of winning at the stock market game. Here's the normal pattern of dopamine release. 
It looks something like a roller coaster because, in biology, what goes up must come down. It could be food, sex, or even water when you're thirsty. So, let's say you're hungry. Dopamine starts rising. Then you think about a burger, and it rises more. When the burger is sizzling, dopamine's going way up. It peaks right about your first bite. Then you take some more bites, and it starts to drop off. And finally, drops back down to normal levels, and you're full. This graph could also represent masturbating or having sex, and the peak would be right about at orgasm. However, I really want to point out that the experience of orgasm is probably driven by other neurochemicals called opiate, not dopamine. So, dopamine drives you towards orgasm, but the feeling of orgasm arises from something else. The rise of dopamine levels could also represent anything new or novel, because dopamine loves novelty. A new car, a just-released movie, the latest gadget. We're all hooked on dopamine. You can have a spike of dopamine just by ordering dessert, even though you haven't finished what's on your plate. Dessert is something new. In fact, dopamine surging in your reward circuitry can override your feelings of what's called satiety or fullness, regardless of what your rational brain may think about overeating or even watching porn. As with everything new, the thrill fades and dopamine levels drop. Now, back to the Coolidge effect. So. Dopamine is what is behind the Coolidge effect. If you look at our little graph here, we have a female rat number one, female rat number two, and dopamine level. What's happening is that the reward circuitry of the male is squirting less and less dopamine in each copulation with female number one, and then eventually the male can no longer copulate because there's not enough dopamine. Dopamine is behind libido. Then you drop in female number two. And the male gets another squirt of dopamine that surges his libido, and he goes back to work. This is what's behind the Coolidge effect, and it's also why you click onto new videos while you're watching porn to get another big squirt of dopamine with something novel. Okay, let's give another nickname to dopamine. Let's call it the molecule of addiction. It's because changes in your brain that lead to addiction caused by changes in dopamine level. Cocaine, alcohol, nicotine. They all feel different, but all of them flood the reward circuitry with dopamine. All addictive chemicals and activities raise dopamine levels. It's what makes them potentially addictive. Of course, you need continued use of the addictive substance or activity to cause physical changes that lead to addiction. Here's an odd thing: we've mentioned it before. Dopamine is released in response to expectations rather than actual levels of pleasure. It's the drive to get it. It's the craving. But as I've mentioned, the actual pleasure of eating or orgasm is probably opioids. Those are morphine-like chemicals being released in the brain. Dopamine is wanting it. Opiates are liking it. Addictions are basically chasing after dopamine. So what happens is addiction is wanting more, but liking it less. Speaking of wanting and the power of the reward circuitry, here's an experiment. We have a rat, and you see there's a wire, and then there's this electrode that's actually going to the reward circuitry of the rat. And the rat has its little paw on a lever, and whenever it hits that lever, it sends just enough electricity to the reward circuitry to stimulate it. Now, what will happen is this rat will just keep hitting the lever and hitting the lever thousands of times an hour until it drops. It won't stop to eat. Sleep, have sex, or even take care of the pups. It'll give up everything just to press that lever. As we know, this behavior is not unlike some serious drug addicts. Here's another experiment. They take the same rat and they have an electric grid between the lever and the rat. So the rat has to feel painful shock in its little paws to go over to the lever and press it. Well, the rat will actually cross the bridge and endure the shock. But if you take the rat and put an electric grid between them and food. They will not cross the electric grid. They will not undergo shocks to eat food. They would rather starve. Here's more experiment to show the power of dopamine in your reward circuitry. If you take rats and block their dopamine, they have absolutely no motivation. They'll not even eat. They won't walk over to the food dish, and they'll starve to death. But they still like food. If you drop food into their mouths, they eat it and show little rat smiles. They just have no motivation to go get it. They lie around. 
They won't have sex either. The male rats show no signs of libido. The key point is, you need the right level of dopamine to function normally. It does lots of important jobs. Dopamine gives you that positive outlook, good attitude, keeps you motivated, keeps you happy. Incidentally, many psychological problems involve dopamine imbalances, including addictions. This is an addiction test. If you say yes to three or more of these questions, then you have an addiction. At least, according to the American Psychiatric Association. I want to admit that this is slightly abridged. I had to take some things out, and the reality is, it's used for substance abuse, not for porn addiction. If you say yes to two or less, then you can just stop the video and click onto your favorite site. Let's go over each one. Tolerance. That's a strange word, but it means, has your use increased or escalated over time? In other words, do you watch it for more hours? Or have you escalated to more shocking or more extreme porn? Withdrawal. It's not necessary to have withdrawal symptoms if you have an addiction, but most users on our forum do experience some symptoms when they quit. It varies a lot. Could be anxiety, irritability, fatigue, depression. Those are the most common. But some also experience physical symptoms, like cold and flu symptoms, headaches, the inability to sleep, and mm. others. Number three, difficulty controlling your use. So, do you use for a longer time than you'd like to? I think that's pretty clear, self-explanatory. Number four, do you understand the negative consequences it does to your mood, to your health? Porn use has been associated with anxiety disorder and sexual dysfunction. Number five, neglecting or postponing activities. It means, are you doing porn instead of life? Number six, the desire to cut down. Now, most addicts say they can quit any time, but they don't. If you've had unsuccessful attempts to cut down, that would be a yes to that question. And last one, number seven, spending significant time or emotional energy obtaining, using, concealing, planning, or recovering from use. Have you ever concealed your porn use? I think everyone can say yes to that. Here's an explanation on behavioral addictions. It's common knowledge that dopamine-raising substances like alcohol, cocaine, or meth can cause brain changes that lead to addiction. But what about so-called behavioral addictions? These are such things as food, gambling, sex, video games, shopping. Do they cause brain changes that lead to addiction? Well, of course they do. That's why they are addictions. Recent research on gambling, and especially food, has shown brain changes that mimic drug addiction. Internet porn? No one wants to study it. Also, there hasn't been time for many study, because it's a very recent phenomenon. Now, you tell me, which is more stimulating? Eating cheesecake or masturbating to porn? It's known that sex, masturbation, orgasm raise dopamine levels far higher than eating food. Which can you spend more time doing in a day? Eating or edging to porn? Let's talk about natural reinforcers. Natural reinforcer is a fancy word for a non-drug activity that causes dopamine release. That includes food, sex, gambling, video games. Now, if you look at the data, about only 15% or less of drug users, this includes animals too, ever become addicted. Obviously, genes are in play, as are childhood experiences. If you look at natural reinforcers, and of course, food is a powerful one, we have a much higher percentage of people who can become addicted. Though, it takes a lot longer than it would with addictive drugs. Now, if you think about it, few people want to be fat. Yet, in modern Western cultures, most people are. Now, rats, on the other hand, don't care if they're fat. When they eat Western food, almost all of them overconsume and become obese, not just fat. This suggests two things when it comes to natural reinforcers. Our reward circuitry evolved. It evolved to drive us toward food and sex and not drugs. That's why so many people can potentially get addicted to food and internet porn. And the other thing is that highly stimulating versions of food and sex can hook us even when we're not genetically susceptible to substance addictions. Here's the question. When can natural reinforcers become addictive? Number one when they are a highly stimulating version of what our ancestors found really irresistible. Number two, when something is available in limitless supply. Number three, it comes in lots of varieties. 
which is the novelty factor. Number four, we binge on it without realizing it's triggering brain changes. Now, I think modern food and internet porn fall into all four categories. Both can override our brain's natural satiation mechanisms. The I'm done feeling. And that's because calories and fertilization opportunities really are genes top priorities. Our limbic system's top priority. Here's what all addictions share. Number one, a numbing of the reward circuitry. And number two, rewiring of brain circuits. We're going to go into depth in all of these. So if you have a numbing of the reward circuitry, you've messed up your dopamine response in some way. It becomes harder to stimulate that part of your brain. Whether with food, or sex, or drugs, or rock and roll, you simply feel less pleasure. Now, feeling less pleasure leads to craving whatever will give you more pleasure, and that's often your addiction. Your reward circuitry is now basically like a flashlight with fading batteries. Next, how does the rewiring of brain circuits happen? Well, a couple of things. First, you get a stronger go for it signal. Go for what? Go for the addiction. You've wired together a bunch of nerve cells that are screaming, let's do that again. Let's repeat the addictive behavior. This simply adds to the cravings of the numbed reward circuitry. Think of our circuitry as a muscle. If you exercise more, it will grow stronger. But if you seldomly use the muscle, it will get weaker. The more you use the reward circuitry, satisfying the cravings, the stronger it gets. The second thing is your control circuit, which understands the consequences of your action, will also be weaker. These higher circuits know that drinking a bottle of whiskey or watching porn for 12 hours a day may not be the best idea. So, with an addiction, it's sort of like a tug of war and the go for it circuit is winning. To understand addiction, we need to understand what changes, and that is nerve cells. Most importantly, what changes is the connection between nerve cells. The brain contains billions of nerve cells, and they're connected in circuits or pathways, like the reward circuit, and endless other circuits. When a circuit is activated, we have a thought, a feeling, an experience specific to those circuits. Okay. We're going to get down to the basics of the fact here. We have a picture of two nerve cells, and they're connected at a tiny little gap called a synapse. See, you have electricity that flows along one nerve cell to the other nerve cell, but it really doesn't. The electricity stops at this little gap, and it causes the sending nerve cell to release neurochemicals, maybe dopamine. And then, they float over, and they attach to the receiving nerve cell. They attach to places called receptors. Really look at those, it's going to be important. Now, the receptors are like little ears on the receiving nerve cell, and it can listen to the message that's being sent. There are many neurochemicals in the brain, many types, each with a different message. If there are enough neurochemicals released from the sending cell, the receiving cell hears the message and fires an impulse. And then we have an experience. Why am I boring you with all this stuff about the synapse? Why do we care about the synapse? This gap between two nerve cells? Well, this is where all addictions occur. All addictions. Changes here in the synapse lead to a numbed pleasure response and rewiring of the brain. What we have right now, at the left and right, is the nerve cells communicating. The red round things are dopamine being released by the sending nerve cells, and they're sending it from other parts of the brain. Now, the receiving nerve cells notice this reward nerve cells, and are receiving the message. So, electricity flows along the nerve cells. The more electricity comes, the more dopamine is released. So if you look at the left one, you have a whole lot of dopamine, because you have more impulses of electricity heading down the reward cell. This would give you a greater experience of excitement. It may be like heading towards orgasm. You're high. You don't want to stop. Let's look at the right cell. You can see there's hardly any dopamine being released. This could be after an orgasm, where you have no desire whatsoever. So the level of neurochemical or dopamine release equals the power of the message. From something like methamphetamine or cocaine, the power of the message or dopamine can be huge. Here we are again, looking at a synapse. Notice the receptors. So the key is that the receiving cell is able to hear the message through the receptors. As I said, 
The receptors are like ears, or some people say it's like little locks. And in this case, dopamine is the key that unlocks them. And when they're unlocked, the message continues along the receiving nerve cell. Now, if you look at this picture, the cell's normal number of receptors is full of dopamine. Here it's simplified to just four. So a go signal is being transmitted to the receiving cell. You need all those receptors activated to properly hear the message. With addiction, changes occur with the number of receptors. If you look at this, you have the normal number of receptors. In other words, the receiving cell can hear the message. The reward circuitry can hear it. While in this case, the number is low. Only a couple. This is what happens in all addictions. The D2 receptor is the type of dopamine receptor that actually crashes. That may not be interesting, but I need to mention that. Now with overstimulation, the dopamine will overflow into the synapse. The receiving nerve cell says, enough, I can't handle all this dopamine. It's like someone screams at you and you cover your ears. Well, nerve cells accomplish this by getting rid of their dopamine receptors. In other words, you may have plenty of gas to run the reward circuitry. That is the dopamine. But your engine is missing some of the cylinders, the receptors. Fewer dopamine receptors lead to a weakened sensitivity or numbed pleasure response. This is what all addictions have in common. Basically, your brain is crying out, I need more dopamine to feel okay. But there are not enough receptors to hear the message. Literally, there's not enough electricity flowing in the reward circuitry to make you feel okay. You have less pleasure from normal everyday things, such as chocolate ice cream hmm. or foreplay or watching your favorite TV show. The low receptors lead to other symptoms also, such as being tired, depressed, anxious, irritable. Until someone goes all the way through withdrawal and the dopamine receptors bounce back, they won't really experience normal levels of pleasure. This is one of the main reasons addicts have such cravings. They're looking for something to make them feel good. The cycle of declining dopamine receptors is also part of the cycle of addiction. It starts up with binging on, let's say, porn. And that causes a decline in dopamine receptors, which numbs out the pleasure response of the brain. Which means mm. you need something more to stimulate it. And that is what shows up as cravings. So, in order to satisfy it, you do more binging. Maybe it's more porn. Perhaps it's more alcohol or more whatever, which then causes an even further decline in dopamine receptors. Now, there's even less pleasure response and stronger cravings. So you binge again. That's the cycle. It's how your dopamine receptors decline. Now, the brain remembers that. Oh my goodness, what is my source of dopamine each time that craving comes up? That's usually the addiction, and in this case, it's porn. So, just the thought of porn jacks up your dopamine and motivates you towards doing your addiction, your source of relief. So, it's a continuous cycle, the cycle of addiction. Let's go back to the car analogy. Here, you're with your dopamine accelerator and your receptor breaks. So, the more you hit the dopamine accelerator to try and feel better, the more your brain responds by hitting the brakes, which means reducing the dopamine receptors, making your effort futile. It's almost as if your brain wants you to binge on the addiction, and I think that your brain does want you to binge, at least on food and sex, or others. And that will make sense in a moment. So, recent research has shown that overconsumption of highly stimulating food, such as sugary food, causes the same brain changes that are seen in drug addiction, specifically a decline in dopamine receptors. Here are the details of the experiment. Now, remember, these are natural reinforcers, not drugs. We have some rats, and the rats, instead of the regular rat food, were given cafeteria food. You might wonder what that is. They had unlimited access to sausage, cheesecake, frosting, and bacon. Sounds like a great combination. Immediately, within a few days, their dopamine receptors dropped and stayed low. The rats kept on eating. They ate to obesity. There were also some other rats, but they only had about one hour of access to this yummy cafeteria food. And these other rats didn't show the brain changes. At least, not during the limited time of the experiment. So the brain changes are the product of unlimited access to overconsumption. Both of which are also found in internet porn addiction. Further research done on humans has also confirmed that the same process is happening in the human brain. Overconsumption of fattening foods has caused a numbed pleasure response. I'd also like you to know that the research on gambling and video game addiction has also shown a decline in dopamine receptors. 
So the researchers are no longer working to answer the question of whether or not the overconsumption of internet porn can also harm parts of our brain functions, but to answer how much damage it can do. In the case of rats with a numbed pleasure response, here we see another cycle of addiction laid out. Overconsumption leads to numbed pleasure response, leads to dissatisfaction, and leads to cravings. So what happened to the obese rats when they were switched back to their normal food? Two things. At first, they would hardly eat it, even though they were raised on normal food. Maybe it was just too boring. It wasn't stimulating enough. In other words, they were dissatisfied. This parallels what heavy porn users often report. Number one, mm. they report that old mm. porn they used to watch is now boring. Mm. It's not stimulating enough. Also, number two, they report that their taste in porn has changed over time, sometimes in startling ways. So both of these arise from cravings for more stimulation and dissatisfaction. Now, a second thing that happened with the rats, or should I say what didn't happen, is that after two weeks on normal food, their dopamine receptors still hadn't bounced back. This was the end of the experiment. Now compare this to rats given cocaine. Their dopamine receptors bounce back in just two days. This is odd because cocaine, of course, releases more dopamine. So why is it that your receptor depletion lasts longer after food than after cocaine? I think there's some type of genetic program kicking in, some kind of binge mechanism, and it seems to be triggered by a drop in dopamine receptors. Maybe there's a reason why nature wants to override the normal fullness or satiety, the I've had enough feeling by binge mechanism, and I think it interestingly works for both food and sex. Sometimes, it's a real evolutionary advantage to override this I'm done feeling. Think of wolves stowing away 20 pounds of meat at a time, or bears gorging on salmon before they hibernate. Or our ancestors putting on a few pounds for the winter. But what about the mating season, when there's a harem to impregnate? It definitely would be an advantage there. See, for mammals, such opportunities are rare, and they pass quickly, so your limbic system is saying, get it while the getting is good. Speaking of getting it, here is one of my favourite guinea pigs, Sooty. He's a real-life example of the binge mechanism, and also the Coolidge effect. Sooty had one massive night stand after breaking out of his pen and wriggling into a cage of 24 females. He romanced each one of them and became a proud father of 43 offspring. When apprehended after the deed, he slept for two days straight. Such mating opportunities were rare for mammals, but today, our environment has changed. Being hooked on internet porn makes perfect sense to your genes. The internet offers endless mating opportunities that your limbic system perceives as real. That's a key point. This part of your brain perceives them as real, even though your larger cerebral cortex knows better. So, as any good mammal would, you go ahead and try to spread your genes far and wide. But really, there's no end to your mating season. You get stuck in sort of a self-perpetuating cycle. It's an endless mating opportunities, which of course is porn. Then it leads to the Coolidge effect, which is binging, then leads to fewer dopamine receptors, and if you continue, it leads to cravings for more novel opportunities, or the binge mechanism. And there you have it. So, at the end of the day, you're simply doing your job, a well-respected mammal job of impregnating the screen. But there's more to porn addiction that pulls you further down the pit, which is where we're going to go next. Another key to addiction is the rewiring of the brain. There's an old saying, nerve cells that fire together, wire together. Rewiring strengthens the connections between nerve cells, making it a lot easier for them to communicate. And by hooking up, they create circuits. The stronger the connections, the easier it is for the messages to travel along these circuits. As with the numbed pleasure response, all this rewiring also occurs at the synapse. Exactly how this happens is very complex, and really not yet fully understood. But rewiring is happening all the time. It's how we learn. It's how we make new memories. The more we use circuits, the stronger they get. That's how we learn any skills, such as walking or riding a bike or anything. Some learning involves repetition, However, some do not. For example, memories. They don't need to be repeated, yet they are also circuits. You have circuits for your graduation, and maybe you even have a circuit for your favourite porn star. A good analogy for forming brain circuits is footpaths. So, when you first walk through a field of tall grass, it's pretty heavy going. 
The more often you take the path, the easier it becomes. You just trample down the grass. Eventually, the path is just dirt, or maybe even a rut. I guess this is how we get into ruts. We can think of this pathway as memory, or a skill, or a habit. The key point is that you are more likely to take the same path again because it's easier, even if you don't want to. Now, this is what happens to you. Your numbed, desensitized pleasure response urges you to use porn again and again to feel satisfied. This way, you created a deep rut, which is then preferable for you because it's the path of least resistance. Now, if we talk about memories, this relationship goes a bit messier. Strong emotions form strong memories. You see, a memory pathway or circuit can form instantly. It does this when you put a lot of significance or emotional impact on the event or moment. Examples include, let's say, having birth, a car accident, or maybe scoring in a winning basket milliseconds before the buzzer. Your brain is excited, triggers some adrenaline, and says, you need to remember this moment forever, no matter what. Dopamine is, again, very important to forming memories. It is only one of its many jobs. But if you also release a lot of adrenaline, the memories are even more powerful, more important. The more intense the experience, the more dopamine and adrenaline are released, the stronger the memories. That's just the way it works. So really, instead of walking to create a pathway slowly, you are using a weed whacker emotionally. If you experience emotions including excitement, fear, shock and disgust while watching porn, then you are strengthening the memory. So if you come across the most disturbing porn, or an event which your body and soul hate and feel strongly disgusted by it, your brain goes, hey, that's a wonderful reason to make sure you'll remember it for the rest of your life. Addiction really is a very powerful memory, combined with a numbed pleasure response. So what makes this pathway so inviting is that your reward circuitry is really numb and you are craving anything to jack up your dopamine. So your addiction is the path of least resistance to relief. That's a well thought comparison to put it. Porn is now your most reliable source of dopamine and your limbic brain is just saying, do it now, me want dopamine. This is the nature of cravings. This is what drives all addictions. Cravings are normal. It's what the brain does all the time, just to get us to eat, drink and have sex. A cue, a cue is a memory thought, feeling, or sensation that activates a craving. Your brain associates a cue with a reward. For example, the smell of cookies baking is a cue to urge you to eat, even if you're not hungry. Think of, think of Pavlov's dogs salivating whenever they hear the bell. If you're a smoker, finishing a meal could be your cue to smoke a cigarette. If you're an alcoholic, walking down the street past a bar could be a cue for you to drink, even if you've been sober for 20 years. For porn addicts, it could be as simple as being home alone, or unintended sexy images popping up in your search result, or meeting a new scantily clad female character in your games, or even a flashback to a porn scene. Cues often lead to an altered state. It creates a sort of tunnel vision, an uncontrollable urge to act. Cues are so powerful because they activate that addiction memory. What happens then is that your limbic system is in charge and your rational brain is basically out to lunch. If we acted upon all our urges, desires or random thoughts, our life would be somewhat of a mess. Here, the yellow represents our desires, the go for it signal, and blue represents our rational processes, the please think about it signal. Normally, there's a delicate balance between the two. The limbic brain wants you to just do it, go all Nike. For example, punch your boss, or eat that pint of ice cream you just noticed in the fridge. Normally, the rational brain comprehends the consequences of our actions and it inhibits most impulses that, well, we might regret. Addiction disregards these consequences. As the addiction progresses, the brain continues to rewire. Your impulse control weakens, but at the same time, the addiction pathway strengthens. Being addicted, you created a powerful do-it pathway or craving. That's the addiction memory. Just as important, you weaken the don't do it pathway as it relates to the addiction. You trample down the go for it pathway and, in a way, you've let the grass grow on the think about it pathway 
because you rarely use that pathway because of less rewards. The rational brain really has lost its influence. That's the part of the brain that remembers the past and understands its consequences. It's in a fog now. Now, two things will happen. Hopefully, when you quit porn. Without porn use, which is your conscious decision to hold back from porn, the blue rational pathway will get stronger and you'll gain more control. The yellow addiction pathway will weaken, in a sense. The grass will grow back into it. But even though addiction pathways will weaken, they may never completely disappear. Remember the tolerance from the previous video about the addiction test? It's the need for more of a drug or activity to get the same effect. It's a major sign of addiction. Now, with porn, you have two choices. To escalate your use, you can spend more time watching porn, or you can watch porn that's more stimulating. This is where the rewiring of tastes kicks in. It's not unusual to start out your porn career with images of, let's say, naked movie stars. And then, maybe a few weeks later, find that you progress to girls with goats or maybe violent rape scenes. Just as novel patterns include dopamine surges in the Coolidge effect, novel types of porn also cause dopamine surges. Adrenaline can also surge if you find a new kind of shocking or anxiety-producing porn. So, instead of getting bored with your current porn star, you're actually getting bored with whatever you're used to watching. And bored means not enough dopamine to get you excited. See, dopamine surges with novelty, but adrenaline also surges with strong emotions. So if you add in novel and strong emotion, you're not only getting the biggest reward, but unfortunately, also the strongest memories. You are powerfully rewiring your brain. You know, that's why porn users seek out what shocks them, or what's forbidden, or fear-producing, because they're getting the biggest bang of dopamine or adrenaline. The more intense the emotions, or the more they repeat it, the stronger the wiring. And each new experience wires a new taste into their brain. If your sexual tastes have changed, well, so is your brain. To sum up, here's the list of what we've learned so far that makes internet porn a unique threat to our brains. It's all about dopamine, and how they cause dopamine to be elevated for abnormally long periods of time, which, of course, overstimulates the reward circuit. Number one, one we talked about in each episode, internet porn affords extreme novelty. So, you can just keep clicking, 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 looking at 300 women in a session, squirting an extraordinary amount of dopamine into your brain. This is what separates internet porn from ancient porn. Here's number two. Unlike eating or using addictive drugs, there's absolutely no limit to the consumption of internet porn. Unless you fall asleep, I guess. This is a really big factor, because when you look at drugs or food, your brain says stop at a certain point, and then your dopamine drops. With internet porn, you can keep your dopamine level elevated for hours on end by watching or edging. That's what really makes it very addictive. Even if you climaxed, for example, you can often override your normal satiation mechanisms by finding some other porn star that's even more stimulating to get you going and give you another boost of dopamine. This brings us to number three. You know, with food and addictive drugs, you can only escalate by consuming more over time. But with internet porn, escalation can switch from more actors to shocking new genres of porn, new flavors of sexual practices that have no limits. And all this tends to gush your dopamine. Number four is even more special. Unlike food or addictive drugs that need efforts to obtain, internet porn is always there in your brain, waiting for you to replay it. I imagine a lot of you have experienced this. Now, it can come in the form of flashbacks that are wanted or unwanted, but they do come back, and when they come back, they cause a rise in dopamine, a little squirt, which further strengthens your addiction pathways. So, what do you do now if you have a porn addiction? Well, that's a really big question. First of all, recovering from any addiction is complex and involves changes on many levels. Now, this video is focusing on brain mechanics, and that's where I'm going to stay. So if you have porn addiction, it means you have numbed out your pleasure response and rewired your brain. How to revert those changes? Well, you take a time out. I know that may not sound easy, but that's what you want to do. We call this rebalancing the brain, and it's absolutely necessary. It has two parts. The first part is rebooting, and that's the idea of restoring the sensitivity of your reward circuitry. 
That means allowing your dopamine receptors to return to previous levels. And number two is rewiring, which is basically to unlearn and relearn. It involves your brain's neuroplasticity ability to weaken your addiction pathways and, of course, strengthen your rational logical pathways. So the best way to reboot and rewire is actually to give your brain a rest from intense sexual stimulation such as porn, masturbation, orgasm and sexual fantasy and wait until it returns to normal responsiveness. Yeah, I know it may sound like suicide for some of you to stop masturbating. But for most porn users, masturbation is tightly linked to porn fantasy, either during or after, and that can really trigger you into using again because it activates those addiction pathways. Here's that picture again. The left synapse has very few receptors, and the right synapse has more. So you're trying to move from this synapse, which is where you probably are now, if you're addicted, to this synapse and restore sensitivity. You're trying to increase the number of dopamine receptors, just remember that overstimulation causes the nerve cells to protect themselves by reducing the dopamine receptors, which leads to numbness. And if you remember, numbed brains are desperate for stimulation. And of course, that is the root of cravings. So as time passes without porn, you'll sprout more and more receptors and the cravings will weaken. I'm not sure how long this takes because it's definitely not a linear process. There are ups and downs. As time goes on, you'll experience more and more pleasure from everyday activities. That's what the former porn users report. Basically, what you're doing is healing your brain, similar to when you sprained an ankle. It's best to stay off that ankle and allow it to heal. If you test that ankle, you're likely to increase your healing time. So this is the second thing you want to do. You want to rewire the brain, which means to unlearn and relearn. At first, in an addicted state, you have a really strong go-for-it pathway and an unusually weak impulse control or think-about-it pathway. And in this state, it's really easy to follow the path of least resistance, which is the yellow arrow. And why is that? Because that arrow leads directly to your reward circuits and your reward circuit is screaming, do it. Here's how you want your brain to look. You want to make the blue and yellow pathway even so you can hear from the rational part of your brain and not just your impulses. Here's another clever saying. When neurons fire apart, wires depart. That's the unlearning aspect. So when you stop using porn, the porn pathways start to weaken. That was the yellow pathway. And since you're using your impulse control, those think about it pathways will get stronger. So this process, of course, can be difficult at first. There's no denying that because the brain can no longer rely upon the artificially intense fix of dopamine that porn provides. However, as time goes on, this becomes easier because your reward circuit comes back into balance and actually, you sort of let the grass grow on your porn and porn fantasy circuits, which is really good. Now, as I said before, these pathways may weaken, the addiction pathways might weaken, but they probably will never completely disappear. So it's a good idea to be aware of your cues and your triggers so you can avoid falling back into using those same pathways. The purpose of your Brain on Porn video series is certainly not to encourage you to stare at how thick the lab mice are, but to help you be aware that porn is an evolving super stimulus that your brain has less anticipation of and hence help you stay away from the risk of addiction. The brain plasticity that allows the adjustment to porn addiction behavior can thankfully be reversed by not feeding the same stimulus it used to receive, usually termed as rebooting the brain. For those of you who need a self-challenge and want to prove that you're not addicted to porn, or just cannot wait until episode 11 of our video to start your recovery journey, have a visit to your preferred support group initiatives in their online forums like no fap community and join many other brave and committed souls to break free from porn addiction and get your life back. The process will be difficult. You may experience some withdrawal symptoms and frequent relapses, but keep on going and beat your previous records again and again, day by day, and things will get easier. Some pro tips for you to be more prepared for the journey. One, gather as much knowledge about porn addiction as possible. Also, maybe watch our six under-production episodes in the future. Two, change your environment. Limit your internet browsing in private. Invite everyone in or bring your activity to a more public setting. Three, replace your porn habits with something else you enjoy. For instance, walking in the park or reading a book in a well-lit room with your phone turned off and sealed in a box. Four, 
Be ready for withdrawal symptoms. Calm down and try to understand and endure the feeling of anxiety, irritability, fatigue, or drowsiness that will come after. 5. Travel together. Stay in touch and active with your journey mates through the rebooting process. Support each other by giving positive encouragement. All these tips will get you to a good start, but you still have to be careful of triggers along the way. Avoid these triggers however you can by 1. Sleeping early. Staying awake until late past midnight can trigger you to become, um, porny. 2. Limiting your visit to certain places. Places like clubs, music concerts or popular streets, where unexpected people of all kinds meet, may tense you sexually. 3. Limiting your internet mindless browsing. This can lower the chance of you stumbling into graphics or ideas that fuel your desire to do porn. Take a moment to appreciate how lucky you are to be watching this video right now instead of some sexually suggestive social media experiments. Okay, next. 4. Not hanging around very often with people who are still ferociously consuming porn, who remind you of porn or inviting you to it. 5. Keeping yourself busy and productive. Boredom and certain emotions may become a trigger if indulged. There are also some people who do specific weird actions, like snorting water whenever they're about to relapse. Maybe it works because it's weird. You try whatever works for you. Our animated unconditional support is always here for a reminder. Thank you for your continuous support, especially our valued patrons and members who have been encouraging us to keep producing more quality content.